you can find data in, in basically everything. Watching something with your eyes is data. Watching uh, a swing on video, that's data. Collecting something like biomechanics, that's obviously data, it's very important. But at the end of the day, anything with data, it's just context. When you're working with a hitter and something gets as complicated as, as a swing, you want as much context as, as you could possibly get because it's gonna give you as a coach the, the best opportunity to get hitters better. I'm Tanner Stokey. I'm the director of hitting here at Driveline Baseball. And today we're gonna to be going over a hitting motion capture report. First thing you need to know is checkpoints throughout the swing. Throughout this entire report, there's gonna be keys at the top of most pages with like an event tagging legend. What these event tags are gonna be, you're gonna see load, which is essentially before an athlete starts the forward move. First move, it's going to be the hands begin to commit towards the pitcher. 10% body weight is basically toe touch on the front force plate. Downswing is what we consider the start of the swing. 100% body weight, that's going to be 100% of your weight gets on that front force plate. You can think of that as, as somebody's launch position. And contact is obviously when you're making contact with the ball. On all of the graphs as we work through this, you're going to see shaded regions. These shaded regions are, are the normative ranges for high bat speed swingers we have in our database. You don't necessarily have to be in these ranges to be considered a good hitter. It just gives you some context about guys that, that swing the bat really fast do uh, and where you're at compared to them. And it's going to give you some signal and idea of where you might have some deficiencies, where some holes are, and potentially some low-hanging fruit of how you can add some bat speed. So to start, we're just looking at the load phase. Up here on these tables, you're going to have different positions, and then they're going to be at different points throughout the swing. So in this one specifically, we're going to have the max amount of pelvis rotation, torso rotation, hip shoulder separation, and we're going to have your loaded position, top of the load before you start moving forward. Next to all these numbers are going to be percentile rankings. Higher on the percentile rankings doesn't necessarily mean it's good. Lower doesn't necessarily mean it's bad. It's just giving you an idea of where you stack up against the rest of the population. So here we're looking at the loaded position and your separation at the top of the load. This is looking at above the hitter. You're obviously looking at the batter's box here. The red, the dotted line, is going to be the hitter's pelvis. The blue is going to be the hitter's torso. So we're going to get the degrees of rotation at this point in time. And again, the shaded region is going to be the normative range. So this hitter, pelvis and torso rotation, he has about pretty close to the same amount of degrees of coil, we call it. So he's about 8 degrees coiled with the pelvis and just under 9 degrees coiled with the torso. So that's why you see this line right here is basically identical. If this guy had his hips more open at this point in time, the red dotted line would be over here and you'd see the, the difference in the amount of rotation right there. So generally what you want to see is a guy pretty close to evenly coiled with the pelvis and tor torso at the top of the load. So that when they go into their forward move, that's when they're going to start creating separation. Hips are going to get open a little bit before the torso, which is like a big component for creating power and speed. Next, we're going to move on to a little bit more of the same, but more specifically getting into separation at different checkpoints throughout the swing. So up here, we're looking at separation and downswing. Just like that loaded position, we're seeing where this hitter is at at this checkpoint relative to the, the high bat speed swingers in our database. Same thing here. We're looking at where they're at in terms of max separation when they get to that peak amount of hip shoulder separation. And then right here, we're looking at separation at contact. And if you look at this time series graph here itself, we talked about it, that event legend earlier. So these are gonna be vertical lines that work down on all these different graphs. On this axis, we're looking at time. Right here, we're looking at, at degrees of separation. It's a little more nuanced here because it's, it's not as simple as the difference in pelvis rotation relative to torso rotation. It's going to factor in the rotational stretch of the torso relative to the pelvis. Now we're going to start to get into the stride phase, which is basically from the load into that foot plant phase. Up here in this table, we're going to see different positions, degrees of rotation, degrees of forward bend, side bend. We're going to see the max amount they're at, percentile rankings, and we're going to see when they get to that launch position, which again is, is going to be that 100% body weight point. So here looking at these graphs, on this left side, we're looking at pelvis angles, and on the right side, we're looking at torso angles. So these are color coded, and again, we have the event tags. So like zero in terms of rotation, you're going to be facing home plate directly, right? And anything that's going to be negative in the rotational side, we, we consider that coil. So like the more coil you have with the pelvis, that's basically going to mean like the further you're turning back towards the catcher or towards the umpire. And then as that rotation goes positive, that's when you're starting to turn towards the pitcher. And it's going to be the same thing, torso and pelvis. So here we're looking at forward bend. You're going to see more forward bend is when you're going to be bent over towards home plate. 
And then this side bend, imagine you're facing the plate. This is going to be more lateral tilt in either direction. So more negative would mean your hips are, are facing down towards the pitcher's mound. More positive would mean you have a little bit of a, like a hip hike where you're lifting your pelvis torso up and you're leaning back towards the catcher. Next page. We're still looking at stride phase. So again, we're looking at low to foot plant here. Up here, we're adding in some different metrics in the table. So the blue line, this is just the same thing as that hip shoulder separation graph we were looking at earlier. It's just spread over a little bit different time frame. The hip flexion, the higher the line on the graph means a deeper hinge at the hip, or like bringing the knee closer to the chest. And less hip flexion means a more upright posture. This green line, we're looking at front knee flexion. This is one that gets a little tricky when you see that because this normative range is so big. It's more of giving you signal for, for a stylistic thing. Like if a guy has a, has a big leg kick, you're going to see a much higher number here than if a guy does a, a toe tap or no stride or something like that. And on this rear arm graph, again, we're, we're looking at rear elbow flexion. Think about doing a, like a bicep curl. If you're really curling that at the top of the curl, that's going to be a ton of elbow flexion. If your hand is getting further away and you're straightening your arm out, that's going to be less flexion. And then the rear shoulder adduction, this is basically looking at that rear shoulder, rear arm working closer or further away from your midline. Guys with a ton of rear shoulder adduction, that's going to be the guy as they're loading that back elbow starts to climb up. So it's like getting further away from that midline. There's more abduction there. All right, so next page, we're getting to stride phase velocities. These are basically going to be like a sequencing graph, which, which we'll get into in a couple pages, but it's separating the pelvis and torso, the more proximal segments, the, the bigger parts of your body, and we're separating the, the more distal segments, the upper arm, that lead arm, and the hand. So again, up here, we're looking at positions, degrees per second. This one's all about rotational speeds, right? So pelvis angular velocity, torso, upper arm, and hand. Here we're looking at these rotational velocities at foot plant, and we're looking at the max. So we have the max rotational velocities in here because th these are the things that, that directly correlate to bat speed. And you see that generally the, the more distal segments, the hands, the arms, like those things are going to correlate a little bit better because those are the things that are, that are holding the bat, directly transferring energy into the bat, which is ultimately the goal. But we have the max on here because these things all correlate to bat speed. So we want to know at these different positions, like we, we want to know how quickly you're rotating into foot plant. And we really want to know what those max speeds look like and where you are relative to the high bat speed swingers. Right here, we're looking at pelvis, pelvis and torso rotational velos. Early on, you're not going to have a ton of rotational velo. And then as you're getting into foot plant at the end of the stride phase, starting to get into the swing phase, you're going to see the pelvis start to accelerate, the torso start to accelerate. And on the same side here, you're going to see the same thing. Not a lot going on early in the swing. And then as you're getting into the end of the stride phase, into the swing phase, you're going to start to create speed rotationally with the arm and the hands. Now we're going to start getting into the swing phase. So we're looking at that downswing position into contact. Similar movements, similar things we're looking at here. We have the pelvis. And again, we're, we're looking at rotation, forward bend, and side bend. This purple line, now that we're in the swing phase, you're going to start to see this number climb in the degrees here. So this is going to be as you're starting to turn the pelvis towards the pitcher. 90 degrees, which is about right here at contact, it's pretty ideal. 90 degrees is going to be directly facing the pitcher's mound. Zero would be directly facing home plate, which you're going to see at the start of the swing phase. This hitter had coil early on. As they're getting into the swing phase, they're starting to get their pelvis open and start rotating through the swing phase. Same thing you see here on the torso side. You see earlier on before the downswing gets started, you're going to have a little bit of torso coil. If you map these over the top of each other, you start to see that the pelvis is rotating before the torso. That's going to tie into that hip shoulder separation graph we were looking at earlier. And then from there, again, we're looking at forward bend and side bend. Same idea. More forward bend is going to be more tilted and bent towards home plate. Less is going to be as you're starting to lose that bend and start turning that anterior tilt here into more of a posterior tilt. Same thing with side bend. Zero is again parallel to the ground. Less is going to be tilted down towards the pitcher's mound. More is going to be as you're like tilting up back towards the catcher. Next page. More swing phase positions. Again, downswing to contact. We're getting a little more granular on, again, hip shoulder separation, shown in a different time frame here. But we're getting more into wrist flexion, rear elbow flexion, and wrist pronation. We talked about a lot of this stuff already earlier in the, in the report, but more specifically looking at it here, downswing to contact. This is obviously really important because this is the time period where you're starting to transfer energy up the chain and this is really getting into how your barrel is working through space and the things that are playing a role in how you do deliver the barrel into contact. What you're seeing here on the higher end of wrist flexion, that's going to be the wrist is going to be more flexed upward. And then as you're working into contact, you start to lose that flexion as you're releasing the barrel. 
rear elbow flexion that's very similar to the one we were talking about earlier. Again, think bicep curl. At the top of that curl, you're going to have more flexion. And then right here, we're looking at rear wrist pronation. Think about the barrel kind of turning down back towards the catcher as you're getting ready to release the barrel and get through extension. Next page. All right, so now we're getting deeper into the swing phase velocities here. So this is similar to the pelvis and torso graph we were looking at earlier uh, and that lead arm graph where you're separated the season graph into the more proximal and distal segments. But now we're specifically looking downswing to contact. This shorter window is really valuable because that's when the barrel is actually working through space. So it's going to give you a lot of signal for how you're creating speed with your body, how that's transferring into the bat, and ultimately going to transfer into your contact quality. So here you're looking at rotational degrees per second over time. You're going to want to see the pelvis is accelerating and then the torso is accelerating, gaining speed on top of that. And then on the lead arm and hand, you want to see the arm accelerating. Hand speed is going to build speed on top of that. Sequencing graph. This is one of the ones you could sit here and talk about for hours. You could pull a lot of context out of this. So generally when, when someone is talking about sequencing, a lot of times what people are talking about is the order your body positions are beginning to rotate in. But technically when you're, when you're actually talking about sequencing in terms of like a, like a one, two, three, four sequence, what you're actually looking at is the, the peak speed sequence. So when each segment begins to decelerate, like when they reach their peak speed and when they start to slow down. This sequencing is really important for energy transfer. It's really going to play a big role in, in how you're able to create space, maintain posture, plays a role in how your barrel, barrel works through space. But it's like really important for how you create speed and ultimately transfer, transfer force and energy up the chain. So here, this hitter specifically, their torso is reaching peak speed first, then their pelvis, then their, then their lead arm, and then their hand. Ideally, you'd like to see a, a one, two, three, four deceleration sequence, which basically would mean that the pelvis reaches peak speed and slows down first, and then the torso, and then the arm, and then the hand. Again, this is one of the things where you don't necessarily have to have that one, two, three, four sequence to be a good hitter or be a productive hitter. This is in terms of looking at efficiency and how you transfer energy. So that one, two, three, four sequence is going to be the most efficient, the easiest way to transfer energy, and you're generally going to see less swing flaws. Guys have better spacing, better posture. They're able to rotate more effectively as they're transferring energy up the chain. Anytime you start to see issues in the, in the deceleration sequence, there's generally some type of compensation going on somewhere. Maybe the hands have to take over early, and because of that, your barrel's not working on playing deep, or maybe it's pulling down and across through contact. So one, you're not effectively transferring energy up, but you're also going to run into bat path issues. And, and in terms of your path and, and maximizing that margin for error, like that adjustability is really important in being a productive hitter in a game. So with this type of guy, you'd really be focused on trying to get that pelvis to reach peak speed and decelerate sooner so you can transfer better up to the torso, into the arm, into the hand. Pretty low hanging fruit for, for increasing bat speed. And then when you talk about the acceleration sequence again here, this was a guy we talked about who was a little undercoiled with the pelvis earlier. But you'll also see that in the acceleration, right? Is that the pelvis isn't accelerating early on. You see that the torso and the arm and the hands are going a little bit before the pelvis. So that's something that gives you a little bit of signal as to why he might be decelerating this late. So in terms of working this hitter, like a pretty low hanging fruit would be able to get him to use their pelvis a little bit more effectively. That's going to help with separation. It's probably going to help with posture. It's very likely going to make a, a big impact on how they're moving the bat through space. Now, getting into the bat path page here. At the end of the day, the bat path is going to be really important for your production as a hitter. On this graph, we're looking at bat speed. We're going to have your total bat speed is going to be this black line. So the X direction for bat speed, that's going to be your speed towards the mound. Bat speed Z, that's going to be your bat speed towards the sky. And bat speed Y, that's going to be the bat speed towards the pole side, right? So looking, looking at this, this is going to be early on in the downswing. This is going to be your barrels working down. And then as you're working further on through the swing phase into contact, that barrel starts to work uphill. This Y direction, we talk about it being towards the pole side, but first, your bat speed is going to work out towards the other batter's box before it starts to work towards the pole side. And then bat speed X, you're not going to directly have speed going towards the mound the entire time. The swing is rotational. The bat path works in an arc. So you're going to see here in the X direction, it's going to be working a little bit behind first towards the catcher before it starts working forwards towards the pitcher. Getting into the attack angle graph, and this is one of my favorite things to look at when evaluating a hitter. So we're looking at downswing to contact. We know the vertical angle, the sweet spot of the barrel is working. 
So early on, you see that there's a massive normative range here for high bat speed swingers, but that attack angle range is much, much smaller as guys are getting into contact. It's not exactly a one-to-one -one thing looking at these positions and normative ranges where you have to be in certain positions to be good hitters. Again, this, this guy is 98th percentile bat speed, but because we saw some of the efficiency issues earlier, right, you, you could assume there's, there's more in the tank, probably more in the tank as far as like moving more effectively and how that's going to impact his bat path. So again, we talked about this page where the hands are taken over early, torso and arms are taken over a little bit early. That plays a big role in how your bat works through space. So with him, at downswing, when he's initiating the swing and things have launched, right, his attack angle is very, very negative. His barrel is working really downhill to start, and then he has to fight really hard to get his bat path back on plane relative to the pitch plane coming in. Looking at connection, this is just going to be the relationship between your barrel angle and your torso angle from downswing to contact. Again, big normative range on the front end, but into contact, that range gets much, much smaller. Similar to the vertical attack angle here, this is going to give you an idea for like that margin for error. Generally, you'll see guys with this high early connection it's harder to get the barrel on playing deep. It's harder to get slotted and work behind. So these are the type of guys that will generally have a low attack angle because they don't really have time to get their barrel to work uphill. They're working down relative to their torso early, so they have to fight to get the barrel back on plane. And you see these types of manipulations getting into contact because they have to manipulate the barrel. That's where the like the wrist flexion and the like wrist pronation type of things, like that's where they start to play a role on how the bat's actually working through space. And then last but not least here, we're looking at force play data and ground reaction forces from low to finish, mid stride to finish. So rear leg, again, we're looking load all the way into contact. On the lead leg, we're looking downswing into contact. So here, what we're looking at, we're looking at force in terms of direction. This yellow line, that's going to be medial lateral. The medial is going to be force pushing towards the pitcher's mound. Lateral will be pushing back towards the catcher. Anterior, posterior, anterior is going to be forced push towards home plate. Posterior would be forced push the opposite direction, back behind you. Obviously not something you're really seeing a lot here. And then vertical, that's just going to be up and down. More vertical force down, you're going to see this number higher in this green range. On the lead leg side, you're looking at the exact same thing. And then from there, you need to get a pretty good idea of peak forces with the rear leg, lead leg peak force, and then lead leg rate of force development. These are all things that are pretty important in terms of transferring energy up the chain, moving the bat fast, and hitting the ball hard. Now we're through this whole report, you see that there, there's a ton of information on here, right? And at the end of the day, all the data really is, is just context, right? The way I like to look at a, an assessment in general, but more specifically a biomechanics assessment, is just going to tell you at that point in time, like, who you are as a hitter, and it's going to give you the signal as to why. You don't necessarily need biomechanics data to, to train and improve and get better, but it's one of the things that's going to help you eliminate the guessing. Maybe you're not going to waste time doing things that don't matter. On these reports specifically, again, we have them tied to, the normal ranges are tied to high bat speed swingers. We do that because that's something that's obviously important. Bat speed, again, linear relationship to exit velocity. Faster you move the bat, harder you could hit the ball, not just your peak, but it's going to really increase that margin of error for your miss hits, right? This is intended to be a very high level overview of what we're looking at in these reports. You could very easily spend hours, tons of time going more in depth, more nuanced. Uh, we, we collect a lot more data than what's actually on these reports. If you're interested in learning more, we have a ton of resources on drivelinebaseball.com. And if you're interested in learning more, drop a comment below.